of his accolades and accomplishments are myriad, and the span and impact of her work has brought us the horizon, and I'm sure many of you here tonight are already familiar with them. Suffice to say this, where the sovereignty of people is championed, championed over corporate persons, she is there. Where earth is cared for as a provider, a wellspring of abundance, and not as a mere resource to be capitalized upon, she is there. Where the stewardship of life and the infinitely diverse gifts of sustenance are embedded within an impossibly small seed code, she is there. Bonded this graceful and resolute insistence on biodiversity as an imperative, on the rights of all people to nutritious, non-toxic food, and on the care of seeds as an act of joy, a miracle unfettered from control of a powerful elite, is a beacon to all of us who envision a brighter future for our children and our grandchildren, for all of us who love our Mother Earth, and for we who have faith in a seed. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bonnie Mishima. You are the sunrise, and there will be a sunrise. 27 years ago, we could see that if we don't change our paths from this limitless growth idea, from the fossil fuel-based consumerism, from constantly putting pollution into the soil and the water and the air, forcing species to disappear, there wouldn't be a future. That was at the Earth Summit in 1992. The Climate Treaty was written, the Biodiversity Convention was written. 27 years later, the tragedy has continued to unfold and today we are in an emergency. because of the young people, because of a new movement that has arisen worldwide, but particularly in the UK, called Extinction Rebellion. A rebellion against the extinction of all species, including the human species. The Fridays for the Future, the strikes. The UK government, which couldn't get its act together on whether they should exit from the European Union or stay, they have managed to, at the parliament level, pass a resolution that we are in an environmental and climate emergency. And the environmental climate emergency is deeply related to the human emergency. Because if millions have to leave their homes and then be pushed out through walls, it's a human emergency though. Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity, which is the equivalent of the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, has just released a report that we are in the sixth mass extinction. This is the highest level of intergovernmental scientists. We have managed in the last few years to drive millions of species to extinction. The signs are so loud and they're so clear from the earth, from diverse species, from the insects, 82% have disappeared in the last 20, 30 years. From science itself, a science not to be bought by the Monsanto's of the world. That's not science, that's propaganda from women, from children, from indigenous communities, and from the increase of disease and the decay of freedom in our daily lives. Life on this planet, our own future, is under severe threat. We've driven 200 species to extinction every day. And 
whether it is maintaining the web of life or the climate stability of the planet or the soils that can give us food or the water that soils need and we need and all species need. The emergency, as was pointed out by you, that the transition possibility is the next decade. Otherwise, following the same path of poisons and fossil fuels. Within a century, the human species will be extinct, like other species have gone extinct, because the conditions on life on Earth for our species will have been destroyed. This planet has evolved over 4 billion years. We only arrived 200,000 years ago. We are babies in the Earth family. And we thought we are smarter than all. So we trampled the earth, we cut her into pieces, we conquered. I mean, this area of the United States is where some of the thinking originated. That the reverence for the earth is an impediment of man's empire over other creatures. Inferior creatures is what Boyle, the New England governor, said. So where we are hasn't just happened. It's not a natural evolutionary process for our species. It's a very violent process by which a handful of men, and when I say men, I mean men, <laughs> have destroyed cultures. The same process exterminated 90% of the First Nations of this land. 90%. So when people talk about the extinction crisis and the extermination crisis, I remind them the first experiment was with, with native people. But the more recent experiment began in the labs of the IG Farben, which was the group of chemical companies asked by Hitler to create systems to gas people to death in the concentration camps. Every ancestor of the pesticides is the Zion bees of that time. The poison gases designed to kill people. Even the synthetic chemical fertilizers, which people find so innocent, they would not find them innocent if they knew what they do. The reason we have an organic movement is because of the harm the chemicals were doing. And most people don't know that the organic movement of today grew out of the work of Sir Albert Howard, who was sent to India in 1905 to improve Indian agriculture. You know, I think that's the problem. The empires always want to improve the colonizer. If they'd stop, we'd be able to solve more problems. And the young people, the indigenous people, the women are all saying, we won't be improved on your term, we will evolve in freedom on our own. So Howard was enough of a scientist to arrive and find the soils were fertile. There were no in pests damaging the crops. He said, I could do no better than turn the pest and the peasant into my professor, the top scientist of that time. As a result of study, literally, pests as teachers means nature as teacher. And peasants as teachers means those who have farmed for centuries. <coughs> India's farmers have farmed for 10,000 years. And he wrote a book called the Agricultural Testament, which became the basis of the Soil Association in England, the basis of Rodale in this country, the basis of the organic movement. Now, there's a lot of bashing of the organic movement these days. Industry would like us to disappear, just like it has made so many species disappear. One of the attacks is constantly to now, now pretend that working with nature is an elite privilege. 
You know, working with nature is everyone's duty. It's the only way to farm. Agriculture means the culture of the land, the care for the land. It's what I have called the poison cartel, the group of companies that were IG farmed and they were tried for human rights crimes. In the Nuremberg trial, all of human rights law has grown out of the Nuremberg trial of these poison companies. Even in that period, whether it was Standard Oil, the robber baron of that time controlling oil, working with IG Farmer, there was a company called IG Farmer Standard Oil, or it was Mo Bay, Monsanto and Bayer, which have again merged, or DuPont, or Dow, they were all involved in making chemicals to kill human beings. And when the war got over, they didn't want to give up the habit. Either of the war, of the money. And they mutated these poisons for killing people into agrochemicals. For poisons that kill plants, the weed aside began with Agent Orange in Vietnam. Roundup, when I used to negotiate on behalf of my country at the Rio Convention, Monsanto's representatives would argue that here is such a smart technology, Roundup, that it kills everything green, and that is supposed to be smart. <laughs> What Roundup has done on this planet is now becoming so clear with the cancer cases in California. And I think we have in the church, Mitch Cohen who's done a book on Roundup. We need to round up Roundup. That's our campaign in India, round up Roundup. <laughs> and of course we have to do everything that can be done through formal law. But it isn't just that the living systems have been poisoned and our food systems have been poisoned and our agriculture has been poisoned, but our politics has been poisoned. Which is why the young people have to rise and say we have to leave school because representatives are, are who are supposed to represent the will of the people and be representatives of, of the people, by the people, for the people, have been reduced and genetically modified to be of the corporations, by the corporations, for the corporations. And when the corporations are those which have skills in killing, it means elected representatives very often become agents of ecocide, which is the violence against nature. And in Europe, there's a huge movement of defining ecocide as a crime. We did a Monsanto tribunal two years ago in which one of the elements was to define the violence against the earth by this poison cartel as a crime. But they're also engaged in genocide. Just look at the number of people getting cancer annually. New cases is 14 million every year. Deaths every year worldwide is 8 million. And it's not the only disease related to the spread of toxics in our food and farming. If you look at the decay of democracy, you look at the lack of accountability by representatives who have been elected by people, you look at the attacks on science and a threat to independent science, then you look at media. How many of my scientist friends have lost jobs. I couldn't because I'd given up my job in 1982 <laughs> in the Institute of Management. So they couldn't take a job away from me. They've tried to attack me in other ways. But journalists who do an honest job, Carrie Gilligan, who's written this new book on Roundup, they pushed her out because she was just doing an honest job of a journalist. 
So the issue of the poison cartel is not just about the material poisons that is destroying life on earth and destroying our health. Look at the data on the health. In every one of these chronic diseases, there used to be communicable diseases. We've controlled those. But the explosion is in chronic diseases. Chronic because once you have it, you have it for a lifetime. Infections you can get rid of. Chronic diseases stay with you for a lifetime. Neurological problems, 2.5 trillion is the cost. These are just costs of treatment. Autism, according to studies that look at that exponential graph, one in two American kids will be autistic because of the attack of these toxics. On our gut microbiome, above all else. Autism is 171 billion. Cancer is 2.5 trillion. Diabetes is 2.5 trillion. Endocrine disruption, 249 billion. Antibiotic resistance, 1 trillion. There was a new report from England that all the fungicides being used in agriculture has led to such virulent funguses that a fungus infected a man who then after 90 days died in the hospital. But in that period, he had infected the air conditioning ducts, the roofs, they had to dismantle the entire place because it's so virulent and it could not be controlled. Obesity, 1.2 trillion. Birth defects, 22 billion. And on the birth defects, I want to tell you that my journey to look at agriculture, because my background was physics, and I've done my PhD in the foundations of quantum theory. But I started to look at agriculture in 1984 where the state of Punjab erupted in violence and it was the place where the Green Revolution was first implemented. Chemical agriculture is called Green Revolution when it's pushed from the third world. And India was the first place. And Punjab was the place where it was implemented. I studied in Punjab. It was a prosperous place when I studied. It was a peaceful place when I studied. But by the late 70s and 80s, it was really a place at war. 30,000 people had been killed with the extremist violence. And the Green Revolution had been given a Nobel Peace Prize. The argument was that with chemicals and commercialization, farmers will never turn to the Red Revolution which was happening in China. And the assumption then was there'd be peace. But by 1984, when violence erupted, Punjab was not a land of peace. I was those days working for the United Nations University. And I said, this doesn't hang together. This is not a story of peace. It's a story of war. That same year, on the 2nd December, cold of night in the city of Bhopal, in central India, a pesticide plant owned by Union Carbide leaked. And it killed 7,000 people that night. I go there when I can to join the women. The women are still fighting for justice. And when I can, I go join them in December. The last time I went was I think 30th anniversary of the genocide, because it was a genocide. These were chemicals designed to kill, so it wasn't an accident. And that particular year, they had decided to do the remembering with concerts by the children who had been born disabled. Some of them were now 25 years old. Some couldn't walk, some didn't have limbs. 
some good here. And they performed all evening. And my heart broke. I said, decades after, decades after, this violence continues. If you add all of these costs, and all of these costs are externalized by the poison cartel, neither the earth nor human beings can afford a chemical, poison-based, fossil fuel-based agriculture. Of the ecological destruction of the planet, 75% is because of this fossil fuel-based and poison-based agriculture. I think you all mentioned that 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions come from the industrial food system. I wrote my book, Soil Not Oil, because in the lead up to Copenhagen, nobody was talking about industrial farming as a contributor. Now, if you look at the data and assign different heads of the assessment, they are about industrial agriculture. So about 15% is the direct production systems, including synthetic chemical fertilizers, which is based on fossil fuels. Most people don't realize chemicals come from fossil fuels. Two liters of diesel make one kilogram of nitrogen fertilizer. A lot of it runs off and creates dead zone, killing life in the oceans. Some of it evaporates as nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas 300 times more deadly than carbon dioxide. And when you look at what are called planetary boundaries, the two big red zones of the planetary boundaries are species extinction and nitrogen, the nitrogen cycle disruption. In both of these, industrial, globalized agriculture has a big role. People just talk neutrally about deforestation. Most deforestation is happening for the industrial food system. The Amazon is being chopped down for genetically modified soil. I've been there for the government, I've been there for the indigenous people. Miles and miles and miles of the lungs and liver of this planet destroyed. And the reason, you know, I mean, one of the patterns of our time is some crazy men elected to power. And you are not unique in that. So don't fall too sorry to say it is a global emergency. <laughs> it's an emergency of our democracy system. Our Brazilian friend has declared that the Amazon will not be managed by the Environment Ministry, but by the Agriculture Ministry for commodity production. It's all GMO soil. It's Roundup resistant. And it is killing tribals. That's why the indigenous people were marching to Brasilia last week. The third category which again we don't count. Everyone wants to clean up garbage. India had no waste. Till I was in college, we didn't have mountains of waste. We didn't see mountains of plastic. We didn't see aluminium. We used to have paper bags and cloth bags. And then the World Bank and everyone who creates the indicators of development said, we weren't using enough pesticides and we weren't using enough plastics. So we were developed into pollution. And now we have, when you go to India, you have mountains of garbage. And the cities that declare themselves clean and get awards, just take their truckloads and dump it in the villages. Just like the West takes its waste and toxics and dumps it on us. I remember I fought a case because the United States was trying to dump toxic waste on India. And we filed the case, and it's the first time the environment minister came to visit me in my house. 
And as he said, can you withdraw the case? The ambassador of US is troubling me so much. I said, put a lock on your ministry. If this is how you have to function and not do your job, they were prevented from dumping that waste. Yeah. I worked with tribals fighting against bauxite mining and other kinds of mining, iron ore mining, limestone mining, coal mining. But the, the one place that always stays in my memory is a fight of tribals against mining of bauxite, which is the raw material for aluminium, of this beautiful mountain, and it's called Niamgiri. Niamgiri means for the indigenous people, the law, the mountain that upholds the sacred law. That is the universe. It is the organizer of the universe. And they resisted. And I went to support them. You know what the biggest use of aluminium today is? Not aeroplanes, not cars. Food packaging. Food packaging. As is, as is plastic. And the contribution to greenhouse gases is 20% of the greenhouse gases. So we are not just creating emissions, we are polluting the land and we are polluting our bodies because in all of this plastic and aluminium is junk food. So I always say it's junk outside and junk within. Just recently, because in those days, in the 90s, I was able to put in place laws to defend the rights of the sea, the rights of biodiversity, the rights of our farmers to save seeds. Um, and the two big laws were the patent law. In India, the patent law says plants, animals, and seeds are not human inventions. Therefore, you cannot patent them. <laughs> and the level of science, I mean, just two months ago, I was in the Supreme Court of India when Monsanto was trying to challenge this Article 3J, it's called. The lawyer was saying, the seed is an empty container. You remember they used to say this on soil, the soil is an empty container for fertilizers. Now they're saying the seed is an empty container and it's the chemicals that put into it that make the plant a superman. <laughs> and that's how the lawyer was saying. We managed to prevent them through an intervention from having the law struck down. There was another law, there's a Plant Variety Act in India because we managed in the WTO to say we, we shouldn't be forced to have the UPO breeders' rights. I won't go into the boring technical detail on that. But we put farmers' rights into our law. The farmers have the right to save, exchange, sow, breed, sell, see, and no one can take it. A Pepsi which has spread a potato monoculture for its raw material. Because for them, potato is not food, it's raw material. It buys a 20, uh, farmers are selling 20 kilogram sack of potato for five rupees. Pepsi sells a 20 gram packet of chips for 20 rupees. Just do the calculation of the percentage of profits. Ago, Pepsi sued three Indian farmers, 10 million each, to say you can't save seeds. I got in the phone, started to talk to the lawyers who were representing them. So just read Article 39 of the Plant Variety Farmers' Rights Act. And the movement grew, protests grew. People on their own started to say boycott Pepsi. Pepsi had to withdraw this threat. contribution to greenhouse gases from the food system is waste. When we grow vegetables in our land, we grow the right amount, and if we don't eat it, it can compost. In India, we feed it to the cow. It can't go waste. But when you do globalized and industrialized farming, the first place where you waste food is through uniformity. Half the cabbages are thrown away because they're not the right, perfect side. I managed to change India's laws 
or draft on food safety where they said, if you put poisons in food and the person dies, it's a 500,000 rupee fine. If a farmer brings diverse food to the market, non-standard non they call it, 500,000 rupees fine. I said, I've built a movement to celebrate diversity. We're going to bring diversity. And a cucumber with a curve is not a danger to health. <laughs> into the waste. That's how so much food is being wasted. In this country, there's a book called The American Wasteland. 50% of the food is being wasted. Most of it on the farm, a lot of it because of the best before dates. Because when you do that kind of trading system, so for the young people in the Sunrise Movement, every time you worry, about climate havoc. First of all, remember the same food system that is threatening your future through bad health is also threatening the planet's ability to maintain itself. I call climate change the metabolic disorder of the planet because this beautiful Earth, Gaia, is a self-organized living organism. Just like our bodies are self-organized living organisms. And when the food is artificial. When the food is imbalanced, you get metabolic disorders. That's what diabetes is. The inability of the, of the planet to maintain its temperature because of this pollution is a metabolic disorder. But it is not irreversible, just like disease in humans is not irreversible. And that's where the poison free food and farming and movements like NOFA become so important. So if you, I think you mentioned so clearly, more powerful in, than the falsehood is the myth, because people absorb it. The myth that chemicals have fed us has led to a system that is starving the world. We've never had so many hungry people permanently hungry. In the richest land in this land, you actually have a new term called food deserts. No other culture created food deserts. The industrial system has. Because food is the very currency of life. What connects life and the food and the web of life is the movement of nutrition. Even the climate disaster is a rupture of the nutrition cycles. The nutrition cycle of carbon and the nutrition cycle of nitrogen. Those ruptures are the basis of all disease of, for the planet and all disease of human health. So 75% of the land's destruction has already happened. 75% of water destruction is because of industrial farming. It uses 10 times more water to produce the same amount of food. 50% of the greenhouse gases come from this system. And on the species, the reason I started to save seeds was I had watched how the Green Revolution had made species disappear. 93% of cultivated vegetables have gone because when you use poisons and chemicals as external inputs, then your farming must become like a military operation. It must be based on uniformity and monocultures. And when you have to have monocultures, you have to make diversity disappear. When the monocultures then require chemical fertilizers, but they get diseases, they get pests, they get fungal diseases, then you go to spray poisons, it becomes necessary. And this combination is the reason of the disappearance of species and the six marks extinction. It's not just happening, it's being made to happen. So if our cultivated crops have gone, and that's why for me seed saving is so important, I'm so happy. You know, I'm very happy. Actually, I said, but I really don't have to do anything more. I mean, look at all these wonderful young people. I can just
just retire now, can't I? But I won't till 2030 and we drive the poisons out and void fossil fuels off our farm. Till 2020. of the chronic diseases come from a bad food system. 75% of the land is used for industrial farming. And it gives us 25% of the food we eat. We used to eat 1,200 species of plants. In each species, we have thousands of varieties. In India, our farmers evolved 200,000 rice varieties from one grass. From one theosinte in Mexico, thousands of corn. Beans, squash, just take it, thousands. The brilliance of nature and the brilliance of farmers has been to evolve diversity. The stupidity of the poison cartel has to be shrinked. And we've evolved a law of the sea. And basically, we, if you look at how does good farming work, <coughs> Seed is bred for diversity, it's bred for quality, taste, and it's bred for resilience. And so we've, in the seeds we have saved in Navdanya, we have climate resilient seeds. We're having a cyclone right now called Cyclone Funny. And my colleagues are out distributing salt tolerant seeds. Because when a 200 kilometer or 300 kilometer cyclone comes in, 300 miles, that's three miles in that, it brings salt from the sea. We have varieties that can deal with that salt. We have varieties that can deal with floods. Bill Gates is not inventing flood tolerant rice. <laughs> He's stolen it. And I have had so many debates with his foundation when they talk about innovation and this and that and that. And I said, can you just tell me the parent? Yes, we love women. They never give me an answer of who's variety they took. It's always, we also respect women in agriculture. Three times it's happened. They divert from biopiracy of climate resilience to we love women. And you know, I have a new book that should be published in this country soon, but it's out in other countries. It's called Oneness Versus the One Percent. And a large part of it is not just on the poison cartel, but Bill Gates is part of that poison cartel. Yes. He's pushing the green revolution in poisons on Africa. And he's very clever. If there's a university, he's given a million dollar grant. And the whole university is forced to work on his agenda. If it's a government, he'll give five million and get the ministries to do exactly what he wants to do. The way the robber barons functioned in the 1930s is the way the new robber barons are still functioning. And at one level, the poison-free, fossil fuel-free campaign is about getting corporate rule of our backs and reclaiming things. <laughs> and as Jaya's presentation showed so clearly, it's the small farm where you grow biodiversity, you grow, you take care of the soil that is actually producing real food and feeding us. 75% of the food we eat comes from small farms. This is FAO data. It's all in my book called Who Really Feeds the World? And this system that gives us 75% of the food isn't just using only 25% of the land. It's not chopping the Amazon. It's not destroying the Indonesian rainforest. It's not taking away land from other species and other purposes. It is actually rejuvenating the earth in a serious way. On climate change, 100% reduction of emissions, absorption of emissions, the whole examples you gave, it's all proven. We've just done a 20-year study on the difference between chemical farms and our organic farms. In, the, in our valley, Dune Valley, where we have a farm, which is a 
biodiversity conservation farm. We grow 2,000 varieties of crops, 750 varieties of rice, 250 varieties of wheat, every kind of bean. And we've just done it because it's the right thing to do. We've got to save the seeds, we've got to take care of the earth, and the rest the earth is doing with us. We have six times more pollinators than when we started. Our water level has come up 70 feet. Everywhere else is going down, wherever the Green Revolution has been uh, spread. And I just want to share you this amazing data because our, our top soil ecologist did this research and he could not believe his own data because he's so much in the chemical mode, you know? So, the chemical soils <coughs> have lost organic matter by 14% in the 20 years. In organic farming, depending on the different crops, because each farmer has their own crop, the increase is between 29 to 99% organic matter. Nitrogen, we, you know, we told that without synthetic fertilizers, there will be no nitrogen. Soil is an empty container. The total nitrogen in chemical soils has gone down 22%. It's a system. External inputs of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers is a system to destroy the nitrogen in the soil. Because you're killing the earthworms and other so organisms that make the nitrogen. <coughs> in the organic soil, it's gone up 100%. And it hasn't just gone up 100% while doing this, the organic soils have been pulling the excess carbon from the atmosphere and putting it to the soil where it belongs. They've been pulling nitrogen from the atmosphere through nitrogen fixing of pulses, putting it in the soil and then the rest of the organisms do their own work. But the part that has really been amazing is we weren't even thinking of zinc. 37% decline in zinc, 14% increase in organic farms. And I had a public health person come from Australia to visit us and she looked at this data and she now explains it. She's a public health doctor who works on brain chemistry. And 50% of the teenagers in Australia are suffering depression. And the brain chemistry is showing zinc deficiency. But where does it begin? In the soil, in the farming. We have become very efficient at creating nutritionally empty toxic food. And calling it yield. And pushing it on the world. Another nutrient, micronutrient. We have 17% less magnesium and 14% more inorganic. Magnesium is vital to attention, and attention deficit disorders are very often related to magnesium deficiency. So, the destruction of soil, we can regenerate soils with love and care, and you all in no farm. I'm living evidence of it. <coughs> Every farm on which you're working is showing that poison-free is not just possible, it's necessary. Climate change, the answers are there. On the biodiversity, we have so much diversity on our farm. Not just because we've conserved seeds, and that's all there. In 120 community seed banks, 3,000 varieties of rice, including in Orissa. I think 980 varieties of rice they have, including the salt toilet, which we used in 1999 when 30,000 people were killed. You know, people are dying today because of climate disasters. 30,000 people were killed and it was called the super cyclone. And because we'd saved seeds, we could distribute salt tolerant seeds. Then the tsunami happened. The farmers of Orissa donated two truckloads of seed that were salt tolerant. And the government of Tamil Nadu had announced for five years the farmers will have to have a farm holiday. The farmer can't have a holiday. But they said five years they can't farm because there's too much salt. We said, well, we have the seeds, we'll bring it to you. 
and the sun, the whole thing always will, but they can't be. And so we bring it to you, you see. And agriculture bounced right back in the first season. Our farm is a living example of regeneration of water, but the science of it is so clear because so organic soils are water reservoirs. And with 0.5% organic matter, you can build 80,000 liters in a hectare. Desertification is when the soil loses its capacity to hold water and therefore grow life. Reversing desertification can only happen through our loving care and the law of return. Albert, Albert Howard talked about the two principles of nature that make farming perennial. He talked about it as mixtures, we talk about it as diversity. And the other was the law of return. The problem with the poison cartel, the poison with the problem with the fossil fuel industry, it is based on taking and killing. It's an extractive system. Whether it is extracting oil and fracked gas, or it is extracting genes and then patenting plants and seeds, or now increasingly extracting farmers' knowledge and selling it back as a commodity. That's what they call big data now. Monsanto has bought the world's biggest climate data corporation. It has bought the world's biggest soil data corporation. It is now talking about digital and precision farming. And making money just like the health system has made so much money through insurance. Monsanto's talk is about $4 trillion of business by connecting the sale of data linked to insurance and then linked to seed and to chemicals. This is a total control system with the end of freedom. For us, the poison free is not just reversing every problem that industrial farming has created, but also sowing the seeds of our freedom. Now, we said we won't measure yield, which is nutritionally empty commodity, of which most goes today for biofuel and animal feed anyway. It's not human food. We said we'll measure nutrition per acre. And we did participatory research with our farmers. We can feed two times India's population through conserving biodiversity and doing organic farming. Two times India's population. Enough nutritious, nourishing food for 2.3 billion people. And because so many farmers are in distress, not just in India, 300,000 farmers have been driven to suicide. 300,000. It's a genocide. I call it a genocide. But even in this country, the rates of farmer suicides are much higher than the average rates. Or in Australia, or in France, wherever you look, farmer suicides are a silent disaster that's happening. Mm -hmm. But farmers going under is a daily phenomenon. In Vermont, they just gave the figures, only 600 daily farms left. And if this trend continues, there will be no farmers. And Monsanto is working, its principle now is farming without farmers. With drones and spyware and driverless tractors. But farming without farmers doesn't care for the earth. Farming without farmers doesn't produce food. If we don't make a shift and get away from the poison tree, industrial food system, we are going to be having uh, not just the end of caretakers of the land. I increasingly say, in, 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 in my language, we have a very beautiful word for, for our farmers. We call them annadatas, the givers of food. And we used to have a saying, annadata suki baba. The farmer should be happy, because then the whole society is happy. And today, it's anadata dukhi baba. Be miserable, disappear. And I call the disappearance of small farmers the other extinction crisis. 
It's a species that we make to disappear through violence and force. It's a war against the violence. But we won't have food, and that's why they're preparing so hard to do lab meat, lab milk, lab cheese. As if they haven't messed up our food system enough. And all of the industry, the fertilizer industry, and the Pepsis, and the buyers, and all of them have got together to create a forum to do prescriptions of what we should be eating. More fertilizer, more chemicals, more industrialized, super industrialized food, and not know what you're eating. And they're going to tell you what's good for you. So not only is the poison free movement a movement for ensuring that our farmers are able to take care of the land and be custodians and protectors of the earth. Not only does every child get good healthy food, but that the future generations will not have to march for a future. Because in sowing the seeds of diversity, in growing local organic, we are sowing the seeds of a future. And I want to end with a little bit of what we've done in this pledge to protect ourselves and life on earth through poison-free, fossil fuel-free farming and building organic communities. When we say organic communities, it just doesn't mean a few organic producers. It means the organic producers linked to those who eat in an organic relationship, which is the only way we'll be able to build future economies. Because the economies of the Walmarts and the Amazons, the economies of the Pepsis and the Cargills are designed to destroy local economy. But this is also about seeding our freedom. Protecting life on Earth makes ecological, local agriculture and organic farming an imperative. This transition is at the heart of the movement for poison-free food and farming. Our love for the Earth will not allow this future of disasters and emergency to unfold. We embrace humanity and celebrate our biological and cultural diversity. We will defend the rights of the Earth and the rights of all our citizens as well as every child. By this, by first making peace with the earth, we can create peace among peoples. By recognizing the rights of Mother Earth, we are better able to defend the rights of people. Together with our creativity and the earth's generosity, we will reduce our ecological footprint and expand our planetary consciousness of being one earth family with one common home. today and tomorrow. Together as diverse species and diverse cultures and through poison-free organic food and farming which offer climate solutions and rejuvenate biodiversity, we have the creative power to stop the sixth mass extinction and climate catastrophe. By joining hands, whoever we are, wherever we are, we must create ever-expanding, never-ascending oceanic circles of poison-free, fossil fuel-free earth communities celebrating our interconnected life and our interconnected freedom. This is the call of Earth democracy, our highest duty as Earth citizens. Thank you. in your communities, and I can just see that very soon the Northeast region will be showing the ne next generation of food and farming systems, and the Midwest will be forgotten. Rawson and Laura Davis 
our executive director and board president for Nova Mass to please come up and sign the pledge. Um, after the signing, we'll take some questions as well. And if you pre-registered for this event, I will be uh, emailing you a copy of the pledge so you can have it for your files. Um, also, our board, uh, board member uh, Vidya Tiku will be holding a, a version of the pledge that you can sign as you leave. Um, Bill Braun, can you come and sign on behalf of the Freed Seed Federation, please? on behalf of the Youth Climate Strike. And may I please have Jean Grossholtz and Diana Riddle on behalf of Friends of Navdanya. Jean has been my dear friend since the 80s. And there's a big reason I come back to this region. And perhaps the rest of the um, panelists who spoke earlier today would like to come up to the podium and we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, <laughs> if, if folks who would like to ask a question could please uh, line up in the aisles because we, um, we don't have a mic that we can bring down. So the, uh, you'll have to repeat the question to the audience, unfortunately. 15, 20 minutes. Okay. So if you'd like to, um, if you have a question for Vandana or any of the um, panelists, uh, so Bill, um, Jen, Willa, if you'd like to come up here, I think we can all fit up here. Come on. <laughs> and who has, any, who would like to start the questions? You've all, all of the answers, or if you've got all the answers now? No matter what, the good intention, an extractive system will mess up the earth systems. We have to have circular economies and a giving back. And efficiency in extraction has to stop being a measure of how smart we are. So, you know, we've done a new report, The Future of Our Daily Bread, and it's available on the Navlania International website. And it has a large section on CRISPR, as does my book, Oneness Versus the One Percent. CRISPR is a very recent new genetic engineering tool. It's called gene editing. The scientists who did the early work were financed by Bill Gates. Bill Gates also created a company called Editas with other investors that have the patents on gene editing. And because he's done Microsoft, he thinks life is 
a word program of cut and paste. But life is a complex, self-organized, constantly evolving system. And in more and more research is showing that for one edit, one edit of one gene, there are 1,500 unpredictable changes in the genome. And that's why the scientists who've done the basic research are warning, saying don't commercialize it. But Bill Gates is not just in a rush to commercialize CRISPR and gene editing, he is now working with the Defense Research Agency, DARPA, for gene drives, which is using gene editing to push species to extinction by intention. They're trying gene drives for mosquitoes as a solution to malaria, an attempt in Africa. In the DARPA report, they have a section where they talk about pushing the amaranth to extinction. Now the problem was that first generation genetic engineering had only two applications, Bt cotton, the Bt crops, and Roundup Ready crops. Two toxic crops we didn't need because we know how to regulate pests through this diversity. We do it in Afghanistan. And we have a one month course in September, the A to Z of biodiversity, agroecology, and organic food systems where we talk, we teach about living seed, living soil, living food systems, controlling pests without pesticides, and living economies where all life can flourish. So the Roundup Ready created super weeds and the Bt toxins created super pests in India, which has then driven farmers further into debt and a year ago, 136 farmers died of pesticide poisoning over and above the suicides for debt. In this country, the biggest super weed that has emerged is called the Parma amaranth. The amaranth is a sacred grain in India and a sacred food. And is a very important source of iron and vitamin A. For women, it grows all over the fields if you're not spraying Roundup and herbicides. And it is a very, very rich source of our diet. The palm amaranth has now become a weed, so instead of saying, let's round up, round up, they're saying round up amaranth. Footnote says, there'll be an impact of food security on India because they eat the amaranth. So I think we all should be scared, but not just scared into inaction, scared into stopping. How can five billionaires be rushing to destroy this planet? Who gave them the permission?
I've like gone to a school system that has one school system that's put a lot of emphasis on like gardening and being outside and appreciating that. And another one that serves this food in the cafeteria that I'm pretty sure isn't exactly edible. So, you know, I um I really think there's a little bit of stigma that comes along, especially when you hit your teenage years of gardening and uh, being outside and appreciating nature. And so having like a young, introducing kids to being outside and that it's not bad, you're not like, I don't know, like your head's not in the clouds if you want to get your hands dirty and like the dirt, I think. And it's so really approaching it from a very young age is diversity. So the first part of any vision is there's no one perfect path that all of us must walk. Each of us has to do our bit. The school teachers have to do the gardens and the nutritional literacy. The organic farmers have to do the organic farming. The rest of us have to know what we are eating and exercise food democracy. But in 1999 when the GMO push was very strong, and uh, Monsanto hadn't given up on the patents issue for India, and we were still working on defending our laws. What we do in terms of the spirit of diversity is work as much as possible with lawmakers to pass the right law and prevent the wrong law. But the most important point is make everyone more alive to the laws within and the laws of the earth. That is Earth democracy. And, and in 1999, 200 villages came together, just like you all here in this poison free. And 200 villages came together and sowed the seeds of what we call the living democracy movement. Living democracy means you live democracy. And living democracy means you live with the rest of life, your forests, your trees, your soil, your children. And living democracy means it can't be an exercise of once in four years or once in five years putting a vote in a ballot. Our moment of emergency and our moment of promise is to precious, to delegate our power to irresponsible representatives. And that's why we must exercise it. And the way we've done it is individuals making Commitment. That's what the poison free pledge is. I will not eat poison food and I will actually save money by not having to go to the doctor. I will see the organic farmer as my physician. <laughs> At the level of farmers and schools, my, our vision is the world will, we have to make the world a garden. Gardens everywhere including one plant, one windowsill. Because if we don't do that, we will have a poisoned and ruined planet with no life. But the most important thing we do, which is something we've learned from Gandhi and we've done it from the beginning, is grow your own food, organize yourself. And when they still come with a law to say you can't make your cheese, you can't make your local food. I mean, every day our women are having to fight. A new food law that says you can't make your local food. You can't save your seeds. That's why I started Nabdania. And, and here's the deepest democracy. To know their higher laws, the higher laws of the earth, the higher laws of our humanity. And when a brute and greedy law says you can't do the right thing, we have to mobilize our power to say no to that law. This is what Thoreau called civil disobedience and Gandhi called Satyagraha. 
Satya Kre means the force of truth. I have just written a, a forward to a book for the Extinction Rebellion, this amazing movement that forced the parliament in England to declare the emergency. And I've said what you are participating in is the Satya Kre for life. We refuse to be pushed to extinction. We will live the truth of life with life. First, by being the change you want to see. That's the biggest influence. Corporations don't shift because you talk to them. They shift when they realize, oh my God, the cancer cases are making us lose. Yeah. And it's very, very important that part of the living democracy and earth democracy is to remember freedom and democracy grow from the grassroots up. So, to partially answer the question you just, we have, I, I want to say this to you and I want to say this to the audience. We have a group that we've just started in Western Mass, which is the Farming, Forests, and Food Systems Alliance of Climate Action Now, which is based on everything you just said, which is based on that what we're looking at is a systemic illness that we need to treat holistically. And that what we're looking at, we need to understand from the inside out. And so I am asking all of you that are interested in this to join with us. We have an organized group. We have some strategies for starting and we need help. And I'm asking you if we could ally with you because we're all working in our little silos. And I don't know what you've done that, that we're thinking to do, but you've already you know, had some success. So I would like to not only sign this pledge with you, but I would like to hold hands with you with our group and do this work together. And, and it doesn't matter that you're across the globe because this is a global, local movement. So I would like to exchange information and be in touch with you about the work. You should definitely follow up after. But if you see the pledge and what I read out, I'm talking about ever-expanding, never-ascending circles. And that means joining. Circles join. Extraction kills. <laughs> well, I think the pledge is outside for signing, but it's not. We don't believe a piece of paper and signing is the most important point. It's just good to stay in touch. But the most important point is each of you to create the circle here. Your particular community, your county, to the state. Yeah, I've been so often to be with Jean. You are the most privileged part of the world and if you can't make this change, you're failing not just yourselves but the planet. and the friends of Mount Danya. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the ancestors of this land that we are graced to stand on today. The Bakumtuk people of the Algonquin Nation. They were the original stewards of this area of Northampton, also known as Norwatuk or Nanatuk, before their land was taken from them. My name is Jennifer Salinetti. I am co-founder of Woven Roots Farm and Education Center in Tiringham, the Berkshires, Western, Western Massachusetts. My introduction to agriculture came when I was a student at UMass Amherst. It was my first NOFA conference that I was introduced to the depth and passion of Dr. Vandana Shiva. 
Dr. Shiva and the abundance of collective knowledge at the NOFA conference played an instrumental role in helping me to see that with appropriate principles and care, farming has been and continues to be a necessary act of social justice. Dr. Shiva also exemplified the significant role women, particularly women of color, have in agriculture. When these seeds were planted in me, for the first time I believe that I could live a life of meaning and purpose in relationship with the earth. For almost 20 years, I have been farming with my business and life partner, with utilizing earth-connected regenerative practices. We have chosen to farm by hand, actively working to draw carbon back into the soil while disturbing it as little as possible. Yielding an average of $100,000 per acre, we are a living example of how a small farm can be successful without relying on fossil fuels and chemicals. We focus on maximizing biodiversity and giving back more than we take. We seek to keep the soil covered as much as possible, watching, observing, and encouraging the rhythmic principles of nature. We have witnessed that our farming practices are mutually beneficial, both above and below the soil, and ultimately provides vibrant, nutrient-dense food to others. Our family and community deserve this. We all do. As community educators, we are proud of the work that we do to inspire people to turn towards a life that works in cooperation with the planet. We seek to recognize our interconnectedness and strengthen our community webs. Over the last few years, I've been serving as a board member for NOFA Mass. I chose to participate with this organization because of its deep commitment to understanding the relationship of soil health and the health of our planet. The foundation of this organization is through grassroots organizing and education. NOFA Mass provides soil health tracks at both conferences for growers of all scales and holds educational events all over the state throughout the year on a range of organic growing topics, including pollinator habitat, regenerative grazing, the connection between the soil and gut microbiome, and organic landscape management. Additionally, NOFA Mass has received a highly competitive cons conservation innovation grant to work with Northeast farmers who are innovators in tillage reduction and soil health. Along with university agricultural extension agencies, data is being collected about soil health under various tillage reduction practices. Field days will be offered for farmers to learn about regenerative management practices, soil microbiology, and nutrient management. After almost 20 years of utilizing no-till carbon sequestering practices, I can say with certainty that it is not only necessary, but completely achievable to have farmers in the foreground of mitigating climate change. Organizations like NOFA Mass provide a space for growers to gain and share comprehensive knowledge and experience. Farms and education centers like Woven Roots Farm serve as a tangible example of the beauty, resilience, and profitability that can be achieved through soil carbon sequestration. This movement is powerful, not because it is in the hands of a few, but because it is in the hands of many. We have a collective responsibility as growers, consumers, and community members to seek out what is right for our communities and our planet. I put that responsibility into practice every day, forever grateful for the spark of hope that Dr. Vandana Shiva and Nova Mass has given me. Thank you. approximately 12 years to prevent global climate catastrophe to the point of no return. When I read this, my stomach dropped. I didn't see this report as a what if, I saw it as a guarantee. I saw that climate change would be the end of humanity. 
Honestly, I couldn't imagine any of my politicians or people representing me stepping up to the plate and fighting this problem. And I couldn't imagine very significant mobilization of some parts of our country's communities as well. Well, flash forward to this past Friday, May 3rd, as youth from across the globe skip school to advocate and demand climate action from our government system. <laughs> something that is incredibly necessary for affecting change in our country as we all know. So I was one of the organizers for the Northampton rally. We had over 150 students in front of City Hall from Northampton High alone skipping school to take charge of their own futures. If that doesn't say mobilization, I don't know what does. We do this not because we want to, we do it because we don't have any other options. Young people are the ones who will be alive to experience climate catastrophe in 10, 20, 50 years that other people may not. And we have been the ones who have been experiencing it our entire lives. I know that everyone has a right to clean water and food, and everyone has a right to clean air. And especially for young people, we have a right to a future. And so that's why I'm here today talking to you, and I'm so thankful that you have all joined us today. And thank you, Dr. Vandana Shiva, for all you have done. Thank you. A third and final example of Dr. Shiva's work on the ground before we introduce her. My name is Bill Braun. I'm a farmer with my wonderful wife in Westport at Ivory Silo Farm. On the other side of the state, I'm a proud NOFA Mass board member, and I'm also the executive director of the Freed Seed Federation. We're a 501c3 farmer-run nonprofit dedicated to the preservation, improvement, and diversification of place-based climate resilient seed for the commons. Influenced in no small part by the work of Dr. Shiva, and Nantanya. Freed Seed Federation was born in the fall of 2017 after years of seed saving, seed growing, and educating farmers, gardeners, and eaters. We were motivated by both the urgency to address that which slipped through the cracks and the perennial hope that comes with growing seed and empowering others to do the same. For most of recorded civilization, the terms farmer and plant breeder were synonymous with one another. It's only within the last century they've been severed as the art of seed keeping has dwindled in favor of the seed trade. Today, in the paradigm of commercial agriculture, the breeder breeds it and the farmer grows it. We have, by and large, outsourced this awesome responsibility of caring for and co-evolving with our food. The farmer has become the recipient rather than the participant, or more importantly, the custodian of the heart and soul of the farm, the seed. Unprecedented corporate consolidation has led to an estimated 70% of the world's seed owned and controlled by four multinationals. As control has increased, diversity within available plant varieties has plummeted to the point where approximately 93% of the diversity that graced our plates 100 years ago is gone. Some 20,000 seed companies were consolidated in the past decades, leading to a dramatic erosion of regionally adapted varieties, seeds that knew their place cast aside amidst the dominance of a one-size-fits-most approach to plant breeding. In response to the exacerbations brought about by climate disruption, record-breaking storms, 100-year weather events occurring every few years, new pests and disease epidemics that we've never seen before, our greatest defense is to continue our co-evolution with seed literally on the ground, in situ, in our farms and gardens, controlled by and for the people who care for them. A large part of our work with Freed Seed Federation is in bringing farmers back into the loop, teaching them how to save seed, partnering them with plant breeders and other independent thinkers in the seed world, 
to play our small role in fostering not only a fortified regional seed supply, but a reclamation of seed sovereignty and food sovereignty for growers present in the future. Such a discussion of seed is intimately linked with tonight's foci from Dr. Shiva of poison-free food and environmentally sound agriculture. A great sense of empowerment in being a farmer today is the recognition that, though agriculture at large is a primary contributor to climate disruption and the breakdown of global health and well-being, there also exists the possibility as ecologically minded farmers to not only cease these destructive practices, but actually mitigate the effects of climate disruption through approaches such as carbon sequestration and the promotion of biodiversity on our farms. Most seeds, even much of the commercially available certified organic seeds, are bred in, in systems that do not reflect this agriculture. Breeding seed in situ, seed that has a home and knows it, is indispensable for the viability of our agriculture. I'm grateful that NOFA Mass has been a leading voice on these issues. Our policy work has included our All Sides campaign, a multi-organizational effort to take action on local level statewide against the dangers posed to humans, pollinators, and wildlife by the persistent use of residential and municipal biocides. We've been a key supporter in advocacy and education on the Pollinator Protection Act and the Healthy Soils Bill, two of our priority bills for the state. In fact, our policy director, Marnie D'Agoberto, and our education director, Carol Rozell, serve as advisors on the steering team for the Mass Healthy Soils Action Plan an 18-month project to create a complete Healthy Soils Action Plan for Massachusetts, a blueprint for improving farming, forestry, and lawn care practices across the Commonwealth. NOVA has also published a white paper by our very own Jack Kittredge on carbon titled, Soil Carbon Restoration, Can Biology Do the Job? It's received international acclaim and has been translated into 11 languages. And lastly, I would be remiss not to mention that the coming issue of our Interstate Quarterly Journal, The Natural Farmer, is all about organic seed breeding.